Hey, GovCon Giants family, Eric Coffey here, your host. Today's episode, our guest is Caesar Nadar. Caesar Nadar is the CEO of X Corp Solutions. In fact, X Corp just built a new facility, a $10 million plus facility that we discuss in today's episode. We also talk about relevance and capacity, uh, why their organization decided to become a prime contractor, how they achieved over more than 182 awards, and much, much more in today's episode. Caesar is a dynamic speaker sought after by everyone out there in the GovCon space, Hub Zone, National 8A, VIP Network, uh, American Express Open, all the big boys out there are looking for Caesar to speak. So this, I mean, we literally just go back and forth. Uh, we finish each other's sentences. So it's an exciting episode for everyone to listen to. Hope you enjoy it. Leave all your comments below in the feedback. Let me know what you think about Caesar. And also, again, we are continuing to further expand our reach in terms of our guests. So if you have any other suggestions for people that you want to hear from us or hear us talk to, definitely leave that in the comments below or wherever you find us at. DM me. Talk, call, give us a call. 786-477-0477. Thanks, guys, so much. Stay tuned for this upcoming episode with Caesar Nadar. My name is Caesar Nader. My company is X Corp Solutions. Okay. So Caesar, welcome today. Uh, we just actually spent about 15 minutes talking offline, um, getting to know fun. each other and stuff. <laughs> so uh, no, I, I learned a little bit about your past, but for the audience members out here who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what it is that your company, Export, does? Sure, sure. And, and, and thank you so much for giving me the privilege of uh, coming on your show. Uh, I was looking at it and I think that you're doing amazing things for small businesses. And I I'm just feel the privilege to be able to uh, have this opportunity to share whatever I can to help companies be successful. Uh, so I really, uh, I was born in LA, believe it or not, and my mom said, let's get out of here, went to live in Ecuador for about 11 years. I came back with uh, 200 bucks in my pocket that my grandpa gave me. Uh, he said, if you, can, if you can find a way to get your ticket, uh, we'll get you, I'll get you the money. And I was selling ice creams in Ecuador on the streets. Uh, and I was happy doing that. I always, I always love working hard. So came in, joined the Marine Corps about six months after I landed back in the States. Didn't think I was going to do 21 years in the Corps, but that's what the Lord had in store for me. I did 10 years enlisted, 10 years as an officer. Uh, got out in 2011. I started Xcope Solutions. It was supposed to be a language translation company, but there seemed to be a lot of need for intelligence in languages. And so the company morphed over the last nine years to become a cybersecurity intelligence counterintelligence, information technology, and training and education company. Along the way, we've done a lot of things like most small businesses do. We pick up everything and anything that we can to do business. Uh, but the lessons we've learned have taught us where we need to go. And now that we have built a $10 million facility here in Quantico, we have a cybersecurity center of excellence. We're now poised to move into the next stage of our company development. Wow. No, that's, that's, that's amazing. Um, and I've watched you. I mean, you've been growing, growing, growing. Oh, well, I, yeah, you do your homework. Yeah, we, we have, we started, uh, believe it or not, um, our first contract was probably within the first three months of our company. It was the, and I think if I had you back then, you would have done the same thing you done for me. You would have done the same thing for me as you've done for these companies. I was looking for the, the book, the playbook. Right. What's the playbook? What's chapter one? Of small business. Okay, I formed my company, did everything I was supposed to do. I went to the SBA website. I looked at the 101 of everything. Now what? I was eager to run, but I didn't have the playbook, which is what you're building here, and show people all these plays depending on the situation, the agency, who is supposed to be the one you're talking to, what industry you're in, what size you are. How do you move from what I call phase one of small business to phase two to phase three? And so we were literally as you going blind out there just right. walking and trying to figure out okay hopefully this is the right way i would sleep in parking lots wait till contracting officers open doors wait there on 30 september the the last day of the fiscal year to be right there for them to say oh you know i need to issue that contract well i just happened to be here which is not true i was there every single day waiting for something to happen but but that's kind of how we grew and what you've seen in our growth is just a constant reinvention of the company. And it's people like you have, that have helped us kind of get mentorship and, and guidance. Because as you know, as a small business, if you don't ask and you don't build a network and you don't try to talk to people who've been there and done that, 
you're going to stall and you're going to do what most companies do, which is hope and wait and try to see if the same thing works over and over. You're the insanity uh, definition. Yeah. So we were constantly refining our formula. And that's, I think, what's helped us with our growth. You know, you, you hit on several points. Uh, and, and, and one of the things about me actually doing contracting is I resonate with you. I used to sit in those offices at the end of the fiscal year too. So I know what you're talking about, Caesar. I was sitting in the contracting offices. It's 11 o'clock at night. We're waiting for the, the, the year, the fiscal budgets to pass from one time zone to the next time zone to see how the money falls out. To see, I mean, I remember people being awarded contracts at 10 o'clock at night, nine o'clock yep. at night. I remember that stuff. Um, and, and that was one point I wanted to mention. And then the second point that you hit on, which is, the hope and pray part. I have a little a model that I show, which is what I call the traditional approach to government contracting. And so it's people, they get registered, they get certified, they bid, 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 and then they hope and pray. And, they go, and so I, I show this little thing, I call it the fishbowl approach, because you're just in this little fishbowl yeah. and they're not talking to anybody. So there's so, imagine a picture of this, right? So, you know, you, you get certified, you bid projects, you hope and pray. And then to me, they're like just swimming around in this fishbowl. And nothing is and, and you and I and you and I are looking at them and like, hey, hey, get <laughs> get out of that. Get hey, of hey, come into the ocean. Stop swimming and I, I know it's amazing. But I, I yeah, I create that and I show and I it's like people I don't they don't understand when they get it. So but uh, that's amazing. So that you've been able to figure it out. Now, when you were first starting and you said you did language learning, do you still do the language learning at all? Any of the language uh, translation? I wish, I wish we did because I was a linguist in the Marine Corps and I was a foreign air officer. So it was natural to do what I thought would be what we know. In fact, the funny story about how we came up with X Corp solutions is that I put on a piece of paper, the day I retired from the military, I went home, took my Marine blouse off and I wrote on a piece of paper in the four corners of the paper, the four things I knew how to do. And I drew an X through it. People say, oh, how'd you come up with x -Corp? Is it counter intel? Is it the 10th core? No. It was a simple X that I drew when I said, these are the four things I can do. I called the lady for the website. She said, I needed three letters for a, for a dot com. I was like, okay, X, what else can I get? I can't do any more Xs because that won't work for government contracting. So I said, okay. She goes, well, what are you? I said, I'm an s, -corp, uh, s corporation. I said, okay, well, then how about X corporation? Oh, thank you. And then she goes, well, most companies, when they run out of, because it was taken, X Corporation. I said, well, why don't you add solutions? Most companies add solutions, the word solutions to it at the end to different. So there it was, X Corp solution. Oh. And we, we did languages until we grew out of it. Uh, and then at, at the point that, as you know, we get out of the next code, which is, again, another thing that a lot of small businesses don't think about when they get certified. Where do you want to be versus where do you want to start? Right. And if you think, if you are focused on where you want to be, then you'll never run out of runway. When you're only thinking about where to start, which really was one of my mistakes, uh, we were in the seven and a half million X code, and we immediately had to transition out of that into the 16 and a half, and now we're in the $30 million next code, just so we can continue to stay competitive in that small business arena. That's interesting, Caesar. Uh, that was one of my first businesses, is the biggest mistake that companies make in choosing the wrong max code. It could cost you millions of dollars. That was me. I have that beginning. video, Caesar. I I didn't know. That's why you no. That's why you said that you and I we relate because I, you know, that's one of the things that I saw a long time ago that I realized is most people again they're not really planning for success. They're only thinking about the present and where they're at. Um, and I think the consequence of that is that a lot of times, like you said, you know, they know that there's a step. Okay, certification and what I do, and they see that the path looks easy at first because they can follow steps one two and three and then they get stuck in that fishbowl that you talk about because they never plan for success out of the fishbowl into the ocean to swim with the big fish and think about that they can actually do it they say holy cow how did i get here it's one of those things you ever you ever notice sometimes when a dog finally gets out of the pen and then it's scary because wait a minute did yeah. i just get out <laughs> what they go back in the pit because they're not sure what to do sometimes small businesses don't, when they don't plan for success, they get stuck in that because they figured, well, I did all the steps that I knew. Where do I go now? And that's where, you know, GovCon Giants uh, and you can help these companies understand how to get to phase two and three and move into the big leagues without stalling, without running out of that initial nitro. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Caesar, so, so now when you first got started, I mean, how did you finance all this stuff? You know, I'm probably the worst example. <laughs> Come uh, on. I, I, Everybody I is you. unique. I, I, I retired from the Marine Corps. Okay. Uh, consumed with the with the goal of, of doing something greater than becoming the being a marine right uh as i told you i grew up in south america and my whole family i brought them one at a time all my siblings i'm the oldest of five uh and i have five kids coincidentally but i wanted to do something very uh fulfilling and like you you know we never think of what we do as a money-making proposition but rather as a fulfilling thing that will permeate and, and create ripple effects for others. So we thrive on the success of others. So when I retired from the Corps, I knew that my, my desire to service was still there, but I also knew that I had to make a living with five children that were ages nine to the twins were about two, three years old. Uh, I looked for my next mission as I was uh, I brought up by one lady, uh, uh, Frances Hesselbane, who was the president of the, uh, the leader, the, uh, uh, Hesselbein Institute of Leadership. And she said, Caesar, your problem is you keep looking for a mission, not a job. And it just hit me that I, I couldn't really go back to work for somebody. I needed to do something that was be, you know, fulfilling to me. And believe it or not, back to our discussion of real estate, I fell in love with real estate in 2007 when the market crashed. And I learned right there and there that investors never see a bad day in the market. They look at investments and it's all about just getting the investment at the right price. Right. So in that, in that process, I learned about government contracting because I admire another, just like you, I had a mentor that I admire. I said, wow, this guy got out of the Marine Corps, started his company, and uh, he is basically hiring veterans. And I, I thought, can I do something that will allow me to hire my fellow veterans? So at first I said, well, who does this? And I said, well, Booz Allen seems to be a name out there. So I, I believe it or not, I modeled my company trying to look like Booz Allen. And I said, I'm, I'm going to make sure that when people say Booz Allen or Exco, they say, oh, same benefits, same pay, everything's great. Of course, I got, a, I got a crash course in reality almost immediately when I realized that Booz Allen and I were not in the same category. But then, of course, through research and just sheer um, uh, perseverance, I, I was persistent in trying to figure out, wait a minute, like everything in life, there is a process. And that process it, 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 and I'm sorry to go back to what I looked at your LinkedIn, but I realized that one of the keys to your success has been exactly what most of us try to do and don't know we're doing it. You first try to master the process in everything you did. I saw what you did in real estate. Then you did another uh, success story in your next company. And then you started your company. And even in this, you look at things and you master the process. Right. Then you say, okay, now that I master the process, in this 10,000 hours of expertise, I'm going to improve the process. So you take these components and you build it together more efficiently, and then your success in how you exceed expectations. And so you start cranking the engine. So for me, it was learning the process, mastering it, then making it more efficient, and then hitting it again and again, and just going after it in more in a more efficient with more partners more robust pipeline you name it right we can we can go on in the different things you know this from contracting but it was really a first an obsession with how do i do something that i can enjoy and be successful at it and it can ultimately fund my passion which is real estate it, and this is how the government uh, contracting piece started because i really knew that there was an opportunity i just need to figure out how to do it and then i said if booz allen can do it so can i that's, that's, uh, I, I love it. I think that was a great description. And also, I think that's really um, a great observation of what, what we did and what I've done, which is true because, yeah, you're right. At everything that I've done at every level, I've mastered it. And not just in mastery in my own sense, but um, I was always an award winner at everything that I did. So, I uh, you know, I was uh, associate of the quarter, associate of the year, you know, Look then I was the mayor, I was a coach. Oh, yeah. Same thing. And then when I got into steel buildings, uh, then I was, you know, top five in the country, right? So again, same thing. Um, I mastered these particular. And I'm willing to guess that the, the thing that people need to capture in what I think you have created, uh, a you are a serial master of everything. Meaning, you didn't go out and say, "I'm the smartest guy." 
and I, I want to be number one. You, you looked at the process and said, how do I become number one by mastering the process? A lot of people don't even want to do the work that it takes to master. It doesn't, it's not impossible, but people don't want to take the time you've taken to say, okay, what does it take to be rookie of the year? What does it take to be salesman of the year? What does it take to repeat it? You learn to master it. Then you learn to improve it so you can stay ahead of your competition. And that's when you take off and then you can't be caught. You're so far ahead that you wake up with the, with the, with the code to master something else. And now the problem is you have a disease. You have a disease <laughs> that makes you be a serial entrepreneur that cannot stop trying to master the process. And now what you're doing, and I, and I mean this sincerely because flattery is fake, appreciation is genuine. I appreciate what you're trying to do for businesses because what you're trying to do is not say, look at me, look at what I did. It's like, listen, if I did it, you can too. It's just follow the process, become disciplined and obsessed with it. And once you master it, find ways to make it more efficient. There lies the real uh, success because when you make it more efficient, you have something you can sell better than your competitor. No, I agree with you. And I, and I was listening to one of your videos earlier and you said that you were talking to the military veterans on um, transition and you were saying something along the lines that the, the that the United States give all of us the ability to be able to go out and do this. Right. And, right. I, and I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I tell people, you know, I've been doing this since 2007. You've been, you've done it for the last nine years. Uh, and so it's, it, nothing has, nothing, regardless of the economy, natural disasters, uh, political officials, none of that has stood in anybody's way. No. I mean, and, and I, and I'm, and I always, Love to hear people say, well, but, and, and when they say but, I get just discouraged by the fact that right. people want to, what they want to use an excuse. To say we call it an exception. We say, when they say Amen. but, they make an exception. Amen, brother. Oh, and that's, just, no, not just, not but. But go ahead, see. I, think, go that, I think changing the mental code that they have about, okay, uh, I didn't think I was going to get here. They, they get scared and they start to find the but, you know, or the, well, I'm not a set aside or well, I'm not because a lot of people sometimes think that because either you're a minority or you're disabled or you didn't come from the right side or the right school that you're, that you're not going to be able to make it. it. It's all BS. It's all really a matter of having the code to do what you've done. Learn to master the process as early as you can. Somewhere along your path, somebody gave you one piece of advice that made you realize that the key to success is perseverance, persistence, and become obsessed with mastery. Like when you practice, right, for, for a game, and right. you know that to get the three-pointers, you have to practice for crying out loud. The guy who stays there longer is not doing it just because it's good for him. He knows that he's going to master it. And then the secret ingredient is to improve it somehow to then exceed expectations because that's the last part that a lot of people – Say, well, once I make money, I'm going to run. you got to make customers become so in love with you that they want you back again and again. You exceed expectations. You never make excuses about money, about performance, about time. You get the job done, and they call you again. That's why you and I, at the end of the fiscal year, became the people they call because they knew that who can do it in the shortest amount of time. They give you a contract on a Friday night. You remember this. On oh, Monday, yeah. you have to have it executed with the people on deck, all of them hired. And by the way, don't miss a day. So uh, I'll tell you something. One of uh, my students, that's, it's, it's funny that you say, I mean, man, we have so much in common. Uh, right. She transitioned to janitorial. Just and mentally, she goes, Eric, you know what? She went out and she observed the landscape and she looked at the marketplace. She says, you know what? I'm going to do janitorial. She went to a conference and event. This was like right before COVID, March, mm -hmm. maybe February, March. She met a guy at the conference. He goes, hey, Look, I'm negotiating a big janitorial contract right now. I'm going to use you as a sub. He calls her up. It's, it's exactly what you say. He goes, look, okay, you get the contract, but in three days, I need 40 people here ready to go to work. And so she stayed up day and night calling, screening. She recruited some of her friends and to bring in and amass a 40-person staff to begin in three days. Caesar, she had no money. No money. So wow. again, go back to people making excuses. She had faith. 
She had tenacity, trusted it. She was honest. She told the person, listen, I don't have the money to fund 40 FTEs. They wow. said, don't worry about it. We'll pay, the, we'll pay them directly to get the contract started because the prime wanted to get this contract started. He had been given the task and made it easier. And guess what? Since COVID, they've been running 40 full-time people uh, from a company. And we're talking about this person went from zero employees to 40. That's powerful. And, now, and with, see, with no money, see, they didn't have the funds. And so now she's up and she's going and she's getting past performance and she's, it's, it's been a remarkable. And now it's just taken her to the next level and the next level, the next level. But you're right. So many people, um, for, I always say that you have to be ready for an opportunity. I think we're asking for opportunities and we're not even ready to receive them. And I think that, and I really think that what you have created here is the, call it the rest stop or the pit stop for companies to say, look, uh, I done what I what I could. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Can you help me? And GovCon Giants can give you those tools, give you the resources, right. give you the guidance, put you in touch with the right mentor, or at least give you a little more gas, a little again, back to the rest of recharge, you re-energize, you say, okay, now tweak this, move in this direction. Here's another GPS location that you can go to and, and hit that hit those points so you can start getting to that success level. A lot of people get to the point in this, this example you made is really great where she could have just been overwhelmed and then tell, told the story a different way. Well, I had an opportunity to do a contract, but this prime wanted me to do it in three days and no money. And that's the attitude that winners have. I they like say, that. okay, here's my opportunity. What do I do? All right, make it happen. Just make it, you know, remember the say, People who watch things happen, wait for them to happen. She's the make it happen kind of guy, like you, like me. We don't, we just don't make excuses. If we fail, it's only because we didn't try hard enough. There is, there's just no failure. It's just we try, we learn, go back again, master the process until the process becomes so refined that we then say, okay, now let's improve it. We have become the master. Now we can improve it, and now let's exceed expectations. No, that's great, Caesar. Man, you got me pumped up. Oh, dude, it's, it's synergy. I'm telling you. I'm thinking, how can we do this on a weekly basis? If nothing no, else? you got me pumped up, Caesar. You got me I love up. the fact that you have been creating something that I'm telling you, Eric, was needed. And it's the one thing I've been obsessed with, helping uh, smaller small businesses. I speak at the National Aid Conference, at the Amex Open, at the uh, Hub Zone Conference, because I, I get frustrated when people start with, I've been trying to do this. And, and I, and, and I almost want to, I feel almost like, stop, stop right there. Just stop right there. You are creating an environment where people can come and declare their vulnerability and say, look, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm ready to, come on, coach, g give me some, give me some workouts. Yeah. And what you're doing makes it so easy for me to share because I believe if I had some of the resources that you've created here with GovCon Giants, uh, I probably could have been more successful. Uh, but irrelevant of what the word success means, I feel like I would have had a, a path that was a lot more effective. You right. and I have had to carve the path. And yeah. now what you're trying to do is show that path to people so they can take advantage of it. So you can bring great small businesses to customers who can say, my only option is not the large, it's a small. Because they do have the innovation, the technology, the mastery. Because that's what the primes are doing. That's They're hiring they're guys like you in our, in our audience here to yeah. do the job yeah. that they don't have to go out there and do. You know what, also another thing, Caesar, that you mentioned that I really, uh, I say all the time to people is that I go, um, in my experiences, right, they're, the best people don't make it to the government world. So there's a lot of opportunities for really great companies out here to come into the government space and really dominate because, uh, because of all the obstacles and the challenges and the bureaucracy sometimes, those companies elect not to do business with our government and I say that to me is a, is a tragedy because we should have the best and the brightest helping serve the United States of Amen. America. And, I, and, I, and so I want to help bring those people in, tear down some of those barriers and showcase them and their skills, their talents, their people to the United States government. And every time that I've done that, the government has been so overwhelmingly gracious and thankful. And yeah, it may have taken time, but after we get in there, I was like, oh my gosh, where have you been for 10 years? Like, we're, we wish we'd have, you know, we dealt with so many other uh, uh, not as effective, not as efficient contractors that, that did not necessarily deliver, 
But like you said, because some of these people, they just, they might have figured out the way, but they're not the best company for the job. They're not the best. Or, or, or they don't know. You know, a lot of times in, in uh, I've had opportunities to talk to companies who are trying to penetrate the, the GovCon market. Right. And they don't, they don't realize or they don't know how to get in and they feel like there's a barrier to entry. Right. They're missing out on an opportunity to sell their products and services to the government, but more importantly for the government to say, wait a minute. So there's, there's more than Microsoft. There's, and again, nothing against any of, the, of those companies, but because you and I don't live on the uh, sponsorship of anybody per se, we don't have to cater to one or the other. No. The truth is the truth. There are companies out there that, that don't get to go to market with the government because they're not discovered. One of the reasons why I created this cyber center because I felt like I can do demos here that allow any company of any size, even an individual who has an idea or a gadget or a, a solution to present it to the government, no specific benefit to X Corp, just the opportunity to bring them to market and showcase their, their solution in a way that maybe their application could be repurposed by something the government wants to do. Maybe the connections to show them. They may not know how to do government contracting, right? Because in the private sector, it's a whole different way of doing business. In the government sector, we have all this bid process and, and you can't discuss certain things. You can't call the contract officer and ask him, hey, how much would you be willing to pay? There's no negotiation beforehand. Everybody has to submit bids. And so it's a very uh, uh, specific process. And a lot of times private companies don't know how to navigate that. But when you got the support of an entity like uh, GovCon Giants, you, you have now a sort of a ticket to the front row to understand how it works and then decide if you can really uh, execute that contract with the government without all, all those barriers that are self-created. Now, Caesar, tell me about your cyber center because that's actually one of the things that my list to do is to create, uh, it is, um, we, 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 I can tell you this, obviously being on, on YouTube and, and having this platform, uh, mm. We received those requests from people who have wow. these technology ideas, inventions, creations. Uh, some of them have been funded, and they want to take it to market entries to the government. So that was my next, my next step. That would be my next mission was to build out something like that. So tell me about your facility and what it does. And, uh, and you said it was a sure. $2 million dollar cyber center. Uh, well, I will tell you that you know uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, well, back up. Uh, in 2016, we won a single award IDIQ for $50 million, about 76 people. And a lot of those labor categories were in the cybersecurity sector. Okay. And the partners that I, you all appreciate this because, right, sometimes you go after things with partners, right? And it doesn't work out that every partner is able to deliver on the work share that they were meant to deliver. Mm. So I found myself with a couple of these positions undelivered. And you and I don't know how to fail. So we know that we're going to get the job done. So I realized very clearly, very early on, that there was a clear gap between the labor force and the requirements that the government have for cybersecurity and some of the other uh, technology uh, positions. So I decided to start a course for my people. Remember, we grew from maybe about 50 to 150 almost overnight with that contract. And so I now have to deliver on a massive contract with 76 positions in six different locations, both U.S. and Oconus, and, uh, yeah, Oconus and, and try to make sure that all of those liberal categories were met. So I started with this idea of building a course, CISSP. And I found out quickly that there's not a whole lot of opportunities to get the course taught the way that I needed it taught for my customer. There's a standard generic way to do it, and this is how we can give it to you, and this is what it costs. So being the real estate guy that I am, I said, you know what? I'm going to lease a space, and I'm going to teach it myself to my people so they're prepared for my customer. Then I did the math like any real estate guy does, and I said, wait a minute. If I'm going to lease, why don't I buy, right? And then I said, wait, if I can buy, why don't I build it? The crazy thought came to mind. I had done residential real estate forever. This is my first commercial build up. And you know this because it's what your company does, right. buildings. Mm -hmm. I've never built a steel structure. Uh, in, yeah, in the the background. Background. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. The thing is, I see it all the background. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the first build for me. And I said, you know what? We're going to build this cybersecurity center of excellence. 
and the Quantico area to do a holistic approach to cybersecurity. We're going we're gonna to plant the seeds and train the people on the first floor with a cyber academy. Then we're going to fertilize those seeds on the second floor by growing them with the cyber labs. So we had, we're going to have an artificial intelligence lab, quantum lab, VR lab, wargaming lab, software hardware lab, integration lab, a place where people can come and play with technology. And if they have a technology, they can come and showcase it. All of it with protection from IP and all that. And then on the first, on the third floor, I was doing what I wanted to do, which is harvest those seeds and hire them. Qualified professionals that were the, the product of a combination of academia, industry, and government moving to solve national security problems. So I got a loan. Uh, I, had, I have a great bank, Community Bank of the Chesapeake, and they were able to just fund this project, a uh, $10 million investment. And I put everything that I own, my, my, my core frame shoes, my uniforms, my medals, my, my, my suits. I pawned everything to make sure that we had the money. You know that we don't find a way to say no. And so uh, once built, uh, we figured, why not, instead of having x be the beneficiary of any government problem-solving request, why don't we let companies come here and just demo and figure out how to solve problems for the government? So the government gets everyone they want, no one they don't, nobody gets left out, and nobody is put there just because they want a contract. So I created a 501c3 uh, foundation, the Cyberbytes Foundation. So basically, every company can be a member as a uh, part of the American Cyber League, and they can market to the government. No need for x to be involved, no financial benefit. In fact, I'm not allowed to get any benefit from the foundation if I'm going to be the founder. If I do, I have to be fired. So I made it to make sure that just like the big companies try to put all the little companies underneath it, the ones that have the great technology, the great people, right? And that's how they make money. I figured let's band as a bunch of smalls and give the government what they want. Sort of like a cyber depot. You yeah. come to aisle seven and you get what you want in the amount you want for the price you want and you don't have to buy the whole enchilada. So that's kind of the concept of it. Uh, I don't want to take too much of the time uh, to explain unless you have any other questions, but it's essentially a place for any company to come. And if they're not sure how to market, we'll help you. If they're not sure how to put a proposal together, we'll help you. And that's not we'll help you at, for a price. We will help you, no cost, no expectation of payment. We want to bring the solutions to the government and let the government pay for those solutions and fund the projects. Cesar, um, I'm really excited about that. That's good. Hoorah. Well, you're welcome. I mean, again, if you, if you want to partner on this, by all means. Yeah, uh, I actually, I just launched a, a because of the demand, I just launched a, again, totally free uh, IT uh, and telecom Facebook group where people could come together with their ideas so that we could start working together, go up to some of these opportunities uh, for contract and stuff. And I'm telling you, I come to my email this morning and one of the, the people, and again, you don't have to buy anything from me to join a group. It's, it's no. free. And he emails me and said, hey, Eric, I just want to show you a video that I captured of some of us got together from your IT Facebook group. And this is where we talked about our goals, our objectives. And it's just connecting people, Caesar, right? It's just connecting people together. And he goes, hey, Eric, I want you to see this video that we created um, based on the group that you helped form and, and start. And so we have people that, again, I've got inventors. Uh, we have cybersecurity professionals. We, look, when you talked about um, virtual reality, you talked about AR, uh, we, the person who created the... Um, you know, when you do the mapping inside the augment reality scenario for the actual landscape mm -hmm. and stuff. So one of the persons who actually first did that mapping over like Iraq, Iran, for our government, like as a contractor, came to me to find out about getting contracts because he didn't, he was, they paid him to do that under a contract, but that's because he was the expert, but he never still, no one ever showed him how to get other future contracts and add on yeah. work. And so imagine that this person was so skillful and, and knowing how to do, like you said, the actual AR, the VR, the artificial intelligence, but not in knowing how to get a contract. That's where I find your passion and your, your, your commitment to small businesses to be the, the source of why you are successful because you see exactly that problem, that right. there's great minds, inventors, people who know how to solve the problem, right. but they are barred 
from from playing in the arena because they don't know how to get in there. Yeah. And you're trying to say, hey, come here. This is the door. Get over here. Yeah. You can invent it. I will help you with the contracting piece and, and yeah. we will help yeah. them. And we're not saying, hey, we'll help you for a price. We say, look, we want to do the same thing you want to do. Solve the problem. Money will flow It'll from every flow. direction when you start doing the right thing and you do it for the right reasons and you do it with the right people. I always tell, I, this is one of the rules that I have for my people, my media team. They say, hey, listen, we have opportunities that come. Can we just go after them? I say, look, I'll give you my, my most important rule. I would rather lose money with people I trust than win it with people I don't. If I cannot break bread with you, we will not do business. Not today, not ever. And that, that's a statement that I've kept so as long as I've been in business. And I, I feel that that has been part of that, that growth and success that you talk about that we've experienced because you know how it is. You help somebody, 10 people will help you back. So as Zig Ziglar says, if you help enough people get what they want, someday you'll get what you want. And that's what I think you're doing with this, showing some of those amazing technology creators and people who maybe don't know how to speak to the government, uh, to leave show and, and let, let, them, let them come to you with this amazing, ex exception award, GovCon Giants, this giant uh, uh, group of intellectuals and helpful people that know how to do one thing, but together we can help you achieve that goal. And that gap that you're filling is probably one of the most underserved gaps in this GovCon space because a lot of people don't get to market because they're afraid. How would I even, I'm an inventor. I'm not a sales guy. No. It, it, I don't know how to talk to government. No. Don't worry about it. Come to us and we'll be able to help. Yeah, I'm sure Just come. And again, being a cybersecurity, I'm sure you've met those people. They don't. Yeah, that's that's a that's a funny thing. I meet them, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're telling me you had this technology, and you, yeah, but I, who would I talk to? Are, are you kidding me? What do you mean? Go to a go to the agency website. Go to the small business forecast. Yeah, right. The are... Director. I mean, you and I have mapped these things back to the way you master the art, right? You you looked at the process. You suffered the pain, and you got the scars of being a government contractor, and now you're in the position when you can give people that playbook, right? Hey, chapter five, here's who you talk to. Chapter seven, here's how you write it. And you're trying to give people this playbook and all they have to do is come. All they have to do is show up and then do the work. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. No, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I'm thrilled and I'm excited um, because like you said, we start solving some of these really big problems. Um, you know, I, I chronicle, and you, you know, you referenced some people in the past. Uh, I did, when I look at what I do, uh, same way you model after Booz Allen Hamilton, I modeled after some really big people as well. Um, and you're right. When I came into YouTube, my only goal was to be number one. I, I had no other goal. It's other in your code, number. man. It's in your DNA. That's your blood type. Yeah, I had no other. There was no uh, there was no other um, other option. For me. By the way, what's your blood type? I don't know. I forgot. I don't remember now. As you say, you that. know what mine is? What? It was coincidental. Be positive. Ah. Interesting. I like that. I don't, I don't remember my blood type. I, 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 I used to know it. I don't remember. I got to look at that because that's a good one. <laughs> so let's, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to X Corp. And, and by the way, everything you're saying is, is right on point. Now, can you, is there a time where like it was, the road was so, so bumpy and not so clear for you? Can you tell us about one of those times? Yeah, I would point to several. I mean, there's, there's different stages at which an owner can be overwhelmed. And I can't say it enough that no matter what happens, I would always tell myself in 24 hours, the sun has to come out, no matter how long it's dark, right? You never, contrary to popular belief, we never stay in the valley of the shadows. And if you are willing to just keep walking in either direction, at some point, the terrain starts to go up. No matter how low you think you'll go, it starts to go up. But if you stop and sulk and suffer and ask yourself, oh my God, where am I? What am I going to do? You're going to just get stuck and you're going to camp out in the Valley of the Shadows. And then you can become a nomad in the Valley of the Shadows. And then you're going to say, well, this is why I was here. And you make all those excuses. There were times where I had challenges with partners uh, as my first contract was a subcontractor. Uh, I had challenges with the owner of the prime. Sometimes you have those challenges where you trust so much and things don't happen the way you envision them because you don't learn early on the value and the importance of an NDA, a TA, spelling out 
the work share, things that are supposed to be kind of a good will exchange that don't need to be spelled out. You shake hands, you and I shake hands on the deal, it's going to happen. I have partners that I literally never had a TA with to this day. And we have been in business for six years. And all it is is a phone call to him and me because our people sometimes don't talk the way that we, hey, we'll get it. Don't worry. This is a mistake. I'll get it solved. And those challenges have sometimes put us in a position, whether it's financial or people, where uh, I'll give you one example. I had, a, I had an employee who had a, a terminal illness. It's very hard to think that, you know, this could happen to you or one of your people. We call our people X-Men. And so one of our X-Men was uh, um, ill and we needed to do more. And I asked, what can I do? And, and sometimes you feel like you can't do more than you're allowed to do as an owner but you can do more as an individual. We had situations where in contracts, we were, we were faced with the challenges of, do we protest or do we not protest? And you always have those in the camp of, you gotta protest, you gotta protest. They'll tell you to do it, but they'll never follow through on putting their money where their mouth is. You, 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 I can tell from your smile that you, you've been there or you've seen this happen. Oh, yeah. And then there's the sensible, more mature attitude that says, well, what will this do for my business? Should I? And in every time that I've had situations like that, where I was faced with this sort of a crisis, right? I wanted to look for another mentor, another, you know, like we try to have other CEOs that have been there and done that, say, hey, listen, what should I do? And I've always found peace in the fact that as long as I follow my faith in my code, everything else will happen the way it's meant to happen. So in a lot of these times where I've had issues, say, with money, I call the trusted people that I've always had. Say, hey, look, I have this shortfall or I have this challenge or I'm thinking about this investment or I'm thinking about protesting or I have this uh, personnel issue or I have this. We had a situation where we had uh, the, uh, one of our customers had to initiate an investigation because there was a, um, a spill, a security spill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that can be devastating for a company that has a TS clearance. Right. Uh, and so those moments define you because they could be life changing. You have the lives of people in your company and their families. And if you make a mistake, you could basically ruin the company and their livelihood. So those trying moments sometimes are lonely and very dark. But I've always found it that I just got to wait 24 hours to get through it and think sensibly about the options map out that course of action, look at what are the consequences of each of those courses of action, bring it down to two, and then make a decision. Because that's why you're there. Ultimately, you may make yourself a CEO at the beginning, but you will only remain a CEO if you're able to solve those problems that people expect you to solve. Because that is your most important job, to take care of your people and make sure that the company is there for them to continue to count on. Um, you speak at the National 8A Conference. Check. Can you tell us some of the things that you hear often from small businesses um, that they come in and um, some of the repeat types of, of questions, comments, concerns that maybe you can address some of those things here today? Sure, sure. Uh, I think probably the top three that come to mind, people ask me the typical question like, you know, how do I get more business? <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those questions that it's open you know, it. it's like <laughs> yeah, it, it is and, and so when they say that you almost want to ask well why don't you tell me what you've been doing and how you've been doing it and then I'll tell you how to get more business because the question is not how you get more business but like you said earlier how do you get in front of the people who are willing to give you business to present your case of why you are able to do the same job cheaper, better, faster, or in a way that differentiates you from the rest. So I always try to temper those questions with, why don't we first ask you, how have you been doing business? Because the question is not how do you get more business, because it's, a, it's an opening the question says, Wait, well, well, I can tell you a hundred ways to do it if, if I just give you a blanket answer, but the question really centers on how have you been doing it and what you should be doing to grow your pipeline. And a lot of people hear that word for the first time ever when they're in these conferences, pipeline. I don't do plumbing. I don't do metal work. It's like, listen, you know, and you and I, 
<laughs> no, learned it's, it. It's interesting. That's funny that you say that. I, you know, I actually take that for granted, Caesar. I that people have never heard Pipeline. Yeah, it, it's you know, crazy. I take a lot of stuff for granted. I, I'm uh, Maria helps me realize that I talk really at a high level sometimes, but I get mm-hmm. that just because of the nature of the, the, the people I surround myself with. We understand each other in our lingo. You develop a lingo and you develop a pattern for how you are communicating, just like we do in the military. When I speak that military jargon and I tell veterans how to translate their resumes into civilian sector, they don't understand. What do you mean they don't know what a motor T guy is? It's like, what do you think people think? Think you're, Imagine yourself talking to a 23-year-old hiring manager. Yes, and I said, yes, he's 20 or she's 23, and they're going to hire you, a 45-year-old, and you're saying, yeah, I was with an LAV company. What do you think they're going to say? Is that a social media platform? Yeah. So the, the, the idea that people never heard of words like pipeline and gates and P-win probabilities, right? right. And, and how do you get to a, a process? A lot of people think that you got to where you did by just walking around aimlessly and you got lucky. Oh, he got lucky because he's got a great, look at his smile. That's why I get business. Or he got lucky because he came from the right school. You learned the process, mastered it, improved it, and then worked on making it, you know, exceed expectations. So when I hear people say, how do I get more business? I have to really back off and say, well, you first have to figure out if you're doing business the right way, how you've been doing business, and then create your pipeline. And then from this, this massive amount of trash, you have to sort out the things that you want to go after. And I talk to them. The second question I, I, I get, which is tied to this, is, um, hey, how do I get into this agency? Mm-hmm. And to, to you and me, it's baffling because you and I don't know the meaning of the word can't, yeah. don't understand rejection. That's kind of like rejection. I mean, to me, rejection is a joy because we know that the more we get rejected, the closer we are to a win. Yeah. So if you're afraid of rejection, you already started on the wrong path. It's like, I, I, and I say this to everybody, don't focus on success, focus on rejection. Because if you're okay with rejection, you will be less sensitive to the no. And the moment you hear yes, you're like, did you say yes? That's it. That's the win. So the second thing I tell them is submit RFIs as many as you can, because that's a way to talk to the agency. We say, how do I get into this agency? Well, have you responded to the RFIs? No, they haven't. RF what? Yeah, they have, they don't Listen, you got to understand RFIs. And then this is, this is an, it's almost like a, a, your opportunity to talk to them before they even know you. Yeah. It's like, but, but, I, but how do I write an RFI? It's like, well, again, you have to go talk to somebody like the GovCon Giants and say, can you guys give me a template on an RFI, which is the most amazing tool. I'll tell you, and I say this too, when I talk at the VIP, the Veterans and Procurement yep. uh, uh, Seminars, I would say uh, you got to respond to enough RFIs until somebody says, you know what? I would like to give you a contract just for the sake of the fact that you responded to this, fi- this RFI effectively. Are you still there? I'm sorry. Something that got, oh, you, you brought up something on the screen. Look. I love it. When, when this Sample exactly. letter I use respond to government research RFI sources sought notices. Download for free. You heard, you heard it here, folks. This is not us. Just, we didn't plan this. We just met this, and, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. What did you say? How can you guys have it right there? Free. Download. It's free. This is how you respond to RFIs. Oh. And I'm telling you, if there's ever the one nugget that they can take out of this particular podcast, download that RFI and master it. Because when I first started, one in every five RFIs turned into a sole source contract for us. Right. When you go look at our FPDS awards, yeah. you'll find over 182 awards to X score. Some of them 5,000, some of them in the millions, but it didn't matter, right? To you, okay. it's not the amount. It's the customer relationship. It's the opportunity to work with them. So when people ask me, you know, how do I get in this agency? I tell them, respond to RFIs, be out there and talk to them. And the third thing people ask me is, uh, how do I do business with a large company? I'm like, well, I said, I'm the wrong guy to answer that question because I made it my purpose to be a prime as much as I can. We have about 28, 29 prime contracts. We have one subcontract. Mm -hmm. And that's because a friend of mine asked me. Now, would I do subcontracts? Absolutely. I would do subcontracts. 
But if you want to get, what I've learned is from, from that particular, the third question, to get with Biggs, you have to go to their website. You have to sign up for their small business, uh, SBLO as I think what they're called, right. a liaison officers, small yep. business liaison officers, and really talk to them about how do you get into their monthly newsletter, into their mentorship program, and start developing those relationships. Mm -hmm. So those are probably the top three that I get asked a lot when I go to these conferences, especially the National Day, which is a very fantastic uh, no, now the yeah. annual conference has become the small business conference, so they really encompass every small business. Say that again. I missed that part. The National 8A Conference has now expanded to include all small businesses because they realized that a lot of the people who were going uh, were going and they were not 8As, and some people wouldn't go because it's called the National 8A Association. Yeah, that's true. And so now they've expanded, so it's every small business of all types inside, in all types in that classes. So, Caesar. Um it's funny. I'm thinking, I, okay, I'm, I'm going to play one of the small businesses. So you're telling me that if I respond to this R5, I'm going to get a contract. Oh, great question. Isn't that, is it, wouldn't that be great if it was that simple? That was right. Uh, and you're right. You're a great question because a lot of people think that when we say this, right, when you and I say, look, respond to R5s and it's going to, it's going to work out. What we mean is you, you may not necessarily get a contract award, Right. But you are going to be in the game. Yeah. You just got yourself a ticket to the front row of the arena. And you just maybe call out to play. That first RFI may not get you a contract. But if you're persistent and consistent, you will continue to become one of those uh, thoughts in their mind. And mm -hmm. then you become a possibility for them to send you to an oral presentation, which is what we did sometimes. And then they'll see you fight so hard during orals and bringing your game, your A game on, that they'll say, you know what? You have tried so hard and you're so hard. It's the end of the fiscal year. I have the authority. I'm giving you this award. So it may work out that way. It may be so that you answer an RFI and they like the solution and you have the opportunity to go ahead and get the award. Or they say, we like what you did, but we don't see the depth and breadth in your contract, what they call relevance and capacity right? You haven't done contracts this size, so we are at risk if we give you something. Do you think you can bring some partners? There goes again another point of why having a relationship with GovCon Giants is critical because you can easily pick up the phone, send you a text, an email and say, hey, Eric, I got this opportunity. Do you know any company in the sector? And let me play the small business to you. Hey, Eric, is there a company out there that you can get me in contact with that does cyber or does artificial intelligence? What size we want them? <laughs> a, a, there you go. 5 so million, 10 million, 20 million. What level do you want? What size? <laughs> Is there a specific Ooh. region? No, it's, it's true. You're right. You're right. Ooh. No, uh, Caesar, man, let me tell you, you're hitting a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, really a lot of very valid points. We, um, I actually spoke at the SBA Success Summit week a few weeks ago, and I showed <clears throat> that same strategy of respond to RFIs. And then what I did as part of my presentation was I listed the, the date that I submitted the RFI, right, at the top. And then I showed, okay, I submitted this agency and RFI on this date. Um, I said the second RFI on this date. And then on this date is when I got the phone call. So I showed them so they could see like a timeline of when I was sent. And then I showed just, just contrasting. I pulled up just three of the contract awards that we had. And I said, hey, look, Here's three different ones. So this agency uh, took 18 months to call us back for something. This one yeah. took uh, 13 months. And then this one took one month. And again, it could be timing. You just don't know who, what they have on their plate. And like you said, if they have something that's also relevant to your current experience or, or past. What I love about what you talk about is that uh, to your point, to your original question, if I submit an RFI, would I get a contract? I believe that in time, you will become known to the agency and you will possibly get a contract. But you, what I love about what you said is two things. Number one, you prove what you tell people to do, which oh. is a lot of times what consultants try to say to people, listen, if you, if you hire me, I can take you from here to here. All you got to do is pay me a gazillion dollars and in the process, you might get there. You tell them, listen, here's what I did. Here's when I did it. Here's how long it took. Sometimes it takes this much, sometimes it takes this long. The second thing 
you, you, you reference, which is something that I do too, is like, here's the process I did for VIP. Cause, cause a lot of times I got this question cause I did the RFI section of the uh, course and I told them how to write an RFI. Cause a lot of people think, well, okay. And I heard this from customers because when I would do the five minute uh, matchmaking sessions, I wouldn't spend my time telling them about Exco. I would spend my time saying, Hey, that guy that just left, what did he say that, that you didn't like? So I can avoid it. And we sit there laughing and that's at the end of the day, I say, well, listen, we're out of time. Can I get your business card? And I'll send you my capability sheet later. Cause you know, in that moment, they, they got a hundred companies to go through. The best thing you can do is distinguish yourself in a different way. So I would tell people how to write RFIs. And one of the things that contracting officers would say or small business people in the matchmaking says, because you know, you know, people respond to RFIs by just slapping their capability sheet to a cover letter and say, here's your RFI response. Right. It's almost like, you get invited to a, a party and you didn't even bother to bring something. You're just, you know, you know, get the chips and the, you're saying, well, I'm here, right? So uh, what you say is critical too, because um, it doesn't, it's not a, it's a cookie cutter formula, but it is a very good way to learn to have a process and to become effective at bidding on stuff without bidding. Because the way we wrote our RFIs, we're kind of like a mini proposal. I wanted them to feel um, excited enough to do that. And you're showing me, is that is the second one? Which Look, one it's is on it? on YouTube. Oh, on yes. Okay. Yes. Our Dude, we're like just finishing each other's sentences. This is like love at first sight. I, I, okay. I can't feel what show we're on anymore. Look, first it's our RFIs. Okay. See, this is what, this is what people need to this get is out the of. Free, by the way, this is free on YouTube, Caesar. And dude, I'm going to have to recommend you to the VIP because uh, this is one of the best kept secrets in the GovCon space. How to write an RFI effectively could get you more contracts than any proposal that you spend thousands of dollars with because it is almost a self-invitation to be heard by a contracting officer or a customer or a small business or all of them. Because the way you write those RFIs can be just music to their ears and they'll invite you. You don't have to ask them. When people say, well, how do I get in this agency? Learn to write an RFI. I gave the VIP 10 samples of the RFIs we wrote. I said, here was, the, here was the RFI request, here was our response, and here's what happened. And so they have, because I give them different samples, you know, RFIs are a very open template kind of thing, but there's a way to write it that could be effective. And the other way that people write them wrong is they spend 80% of the time telling you the set aside that they are. Hey, I'm an 8A. Listen, I'm a woman owned. And listen, I come from the other side of the tracks. And you never told me what you do. You never spend the time to say, okay, got it. I know you're a small business. Let's put that aside for a second. Tell me what you do. Tell me, do you understand what I need? And tell me how you're going to do what you learn and what I need into this new contract. And then at the bottom right hand side, tell me that you're a set aside so I can really say, I love this company. Love, please be a X type of company, no pun intended, or a, a different type of qualification or just a schedule or TS, et cetera. They want that at the end. That's dessert. A lot of us in the small business world want to showcase our metal of the set aside we are versus saying, look, I can do the job. I have the people, the capacity, the capabilities, and the know-how. And by the way, if you need to know, at the very bottom is our category or our specific uh, uh, structure of the organization. It's interesting, Caesar. I, I really do believe that we were like uh, disjointed twins. <laughs> because, Providence, and I believe God put us in each other's path to help a lot of small business. And I hope that we can inspire businesses to really stop listening and start asking you. Start going to your website, go to your podcast, and really learn and then ask you the hard questions. Hey, Eric, you wrote this. How did you do that? Hey, Eric, can you do a seminar on this? Hey, send you questions. The and and if they do, where should they send you those questions? Right. No, definitely the hard questions, Caesar, is, is what I ask for. I said, people, look, uh, in fact, I just, uh, before I jumped on with you, I was on with, uh, I've got a new team of the interns that we're training, we're helping, we're coaching and stuff like that. And I said, you know, guys, look, I have, 350 videos online. By the way, I have a free course. It's a free 18-day course called freegovconcourse.com. And I'm like, I have all this free content. I've got the podcast, like you said. I've got a book. It's 11 bucks. So I might as well say it's free. 
So between an $11 book and all of this free content, and I said, I think I've answered a lot of these people's questions. They just have to go and look for the information. Yeah. It's already there. So I go, what I want people to do is start asking me the hard questions. And you're right, Caesar. I definitely want people to ask me the hard questions um, because, again, all that standard stuff, we already have. We've got it covered pretty much. It's right. already covered here somewhere on my channel to the point where what I showed you, I did. Um, and I'll show you again so you can see actually what I did here is I went to my channel on YouTube and I mm -hmm. searched RFI. So it's a searchable base, database of videos and content. I'm glad you asked that because I was trying to figure out how would you search for the specific topic and you just answer my I question. I just did it. So like if you want to say Sam, let's type in the word Sam. Okay, here. Here's all the videos on Sam. Beautiful. So if you want to type in like FPDS, here, here's videos on FPDS. If you want to type in joint venture or teaming, I mean. And, and, and remind me again, what is the cost of this? Free. It's free. Now, if now if if that doesn't get people trying, that they, they don't deserve to win contracts. The answer to the question: If I write an RFI, can I win a contract? You don't deserve it if you don't at least take the time to do this work to learn this. Because I believe that in in all this library of content that you have, in all the things that you plaster here, both from experiences with you and the people you've spoken with, there is the answer to every question in GovCon. And if it's not there. They should ask you so you can do the next podcast because I bet you there's probably, I mean, let's just be realistic and say that you have maybe 1% that you haven't covered. Then ask the question because I'm pretty sure that you can cover it. But I believe that this content could be the key to people. Instead of asking the question, if I write an RFI, can I win? Is now that I've learned this and I got these tools, I can't wait to put it in play because it's a no brainer that I'm going to win a contract. I just got to implement this. Caesar, look, okay, how do I meet potential joint venture partners? This is Matt Schoonover. One, this is, this is Matt Schoonover, that. right, from Co-Prince Law. They write, they are a Co-Prince Law firm that does, they're at the conference with you at the Hub Zone conferences. Yeah. They're the yeah. ones that write small GovCon. They, they, put, they have their own, they put their own pamphlets and materials on that. Here, a Marine turns a CEO and builds a $50 million construction firm doing joint ventures. Wow. Louis De La Cruz, construction, Jennifer Shao, oh, she yeah. an authority yeah. in GovCon. Wow, so, you got really successful people here, man. I think you're, you're, you're taking your stuff down with me. You got you to gotta get, get people of that caliber. You, this is the B <laughs> team. You got, you got me? I'm the B team, but these guys are exceptional. I mean, what you have here is really great because I'm just, I'm just JV, showing you. Our, that's what we're talking sorry, about. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm just showing you. It's just, I guess you type in the word 8A. Okay, here's the program explained. Here's an interview I did with someone. Here's benefits of the program, how they can work. We've got- You know what you have done? What you have done is you just made my life easier because I'm going to refer people to this because I can only speak for so long when I do these uh, speaking engagements and you have all of the resources. Put, you've done the hard work of cataloging, categorizing, and selecting the topics that you have seen happen. And again, this is not flattery, Eric. Uh, true appreciation for what you've done. You have taken the time to interview others. So people are not just listening to you and your perspective. You said, look, don't, don't, don't listen to me. Don't take my word for it. Listen to these guys and what they did and how they succeeded. Because everybody's going to see themselves in a different look, in a different person, a different voice. And you have been very effective at now taking a lot of these people and doing basically the Socratic method. Ask every question out there, and by the time you're done asking questions, you should be the expert at this process. Right. So the only thing you can do is make those camels drink the water because you essentially <laughs> have brought the well to them. You brought the well filled with water. Unless you feed them salt so they can get thirsty, these camels are not going to drink the water. So <laughs> I encourage your, your listeners to just get off their sidelines and get into the well and learn this because you have seemed to have cracked the code on what you need. You're not talking about it. You're not just talking about it. You're not just preaching it. You have plaster in a catalog of topics that people can easily search and get just about every answer. And that's what we're, and that's what we continue to try to do and, and, and bringing I these really experiences. Appreciate it. Uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. And that's what we I mean, that's what we want to do for people. Uh, again, my motto is, is right. Teaching everyday people how to win extraordinary contracts. And, and that's well, what I'm I living. By and I appreciate cause I'm going to end up, 
uh, benefiting by now I can send companies to that because I, I was building, you know, I got as far as three pages of things people can do. You have a library, 350 videos. Are you kidding me, man? How, how, how do you sleep? When? <laughs> no, I know. I mean, it's, 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 shows? it's a lot of work. It's a lot Five of work. minute naps? Yeah, no, I 20 minute naps, 20 minute naps. <laughs> I did 20 minute naps. I, I, no, Caesar. And not only that, I continue to produce content. Um, uh, you know, I, I honestly, you know, one of the things that, one of the tricks that I do for myself, Caesar, is I look at myself as an artist that makes music. Um, and so for me, um, it's like making new albums or new songs. Oh, that's a good, that's a good analogy. And that's how I could see myself. So I said, wow, I have all this music inside of me. That I need, that I need to sing, and I. That just, is actually very, very appropriate because you, you, you have you have the ability to create a new song from a new topic, and cater to even a broader audience. That that's a great analogy. Yeah. that's pretty good. And and when it comes to the RFIs, I tell people that uh, that's the way that you market to an agency. So don't so look at it as marketing dollars, right? And a marketing investment. You want because people always say, "Well, how do you get to them?" Okay, you want this is how you market yourself to them. So just like uh, social media or anything else, you can't always measure the returns uh, immediately. But that is, you are marketing your business and your company to the agency you're getting in front of them. Um, and and those are some of the same things that we talk about. And again, you brought it up, right? Yeah. You initiated this. And and we've oh. never met each other before. We never had met yeah. before, you and I. So it, it shows that. And you're where are you at in the world? I'm actually in Florida. Oh, man, that's not fair. And where right? are you at? I'm in Virginia. And see, we're so far apart, yet we've experienced the same things. Right. And all we're trying to do here is to help people have a more efficient path. You're writing these songs for people to be able to listen and say, that hit, that's my tune. That's exactly what I've been looking for. That's right. And allow them to get into a rhythm that can make them successful. And all they're doing is they're not willing to turn on the radio and listen to your tune. About that's that. it. No, that's, that's totally it. That's totally it. So now tell us, now you said that uh, before we started this, you were doing some stuff with veterans, veterans transition and things like that. Are yeah, I've always been passionate about that. Uh, when I retired, um, I realized that uh, – you know, we do, we do exceptional things for our country as veterans. And I'm grateful for my fellow veterans and I'm appreciative for the service that everybody who is currently in the service uh, is giving us to protect us. But, but the military is not in the business of transitioning you out to be successful as whatever you want to do. What they do is they make us successful at certain things like process, like execution, like making decisions, right? They allow you to become something better than you were. But just for an example, it takes 13 weeks to make a Marine infantryman. It takes six months to make a Marine officer. In contrast to that, you got one week to get out. Transition assistance in the military is a five-day event. And in those five days, they go through all of this process of transitioning, how to dress, how to talk, resume, how to pitch, where to go to look for a job, benefits, uh, survivor benefits, spouse, etc. Imagine it took three months or six months to, to make you a basic infantry man or woman in the military, in the Marine Corps. And you got one week to get out. Back to the 10,000 hours that it takes to be an expert, right? Imagine they become an expert. And now in one week, you're supposed to be an expert at transitioning out promoting yourself in the civilian sector, selling yourself. And so what I realized from the, from the transition uh, seminars that I went to on base, it's not, they don't, they're doing a great job for what they have resources for and what the mission is. To ensure that a veteran is transitioned effectively with these minimum requires according to the DD-254, sorry, to the, to the DD-219, uh, and I'm sorry if I don't know the right name, but it's a DD form that allows you to say, here are the minimum required by, by a title of the U.S. code that you have to give a veteran before they get out. And it wasn't enough. And so I became obsessed with coming back to my fellow veterans to help them learn what I learned. For example, most disability claims, most veterans don't do their disability claims. And they end up 
getting out of the military at the height of their 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 career, their their um, their their uh, physical fitness, they don't feel pain. But fast forward five years, and pain settles in on your back, on your feet, on your neck, and you don't know where it's coming from. And they lost the opportunity to put that disability claim early because in this case, the military takes a lot of your best years, 18, 20, 20, 22 year old, 25 year old. And if you're there for 20 years, you're now 40. You went in when you were 20, you come out when you're 40, you don't think something is broken or hurt. So I was coming back to try to give them that. And from that, I started something called a simplified breakfast where a lot of our uh, fellow Marines would just kind of get together and I would tell them, hey, I went to the seminar and I learned this. I went to this interview and I learned that. I talked to these hiring managers and I learned that. And then that started to grow. Just like you have grown what you've done. I'm sure at first it started with you just thinking about it and talking to another fellow owners. And then it started to grow and you realize that, wait a minute, everybody's having this problem. It's time for you to do something about it. So I created this, this uh, what I call the Military Veteran Transition Program and put together this six-phase program to help people understand that the first thing you should look at is not what you're going to do when you get out, but who you are. So you can really understand the power of you and then decide how to do what when you get out. So you don't go out and say, well, I was in finance in the military. I'm going to go look for a finance job. I was in infantry. I'm going to look for a security forces job out there, security guard. First, learn, understand who you are before you went in, while you were in and after, so you can really harness the power of who you become to then decide comfortably of what you want to do. And anyways, it's more involved, and I, I don't want to be uh, abusive of your time, but it's really meant to help veterans figure out, just like you said, figure out how to become the best you and never settle for less. Just not a, a powerhouse thing, but just what you're doing for small businesses. Don't give up on the opportunity to take the advice of those who have come before you to help you achieve success. You know, step on our shoulder to get over that wall, right? Because we want to see you succeed and it doesn't require us to be successful in the process. Your success, my success comes from seeing somebody else come back and say, thank you. I, without what you said, I couldn't have done it or what you did transform my life. And that is a check with no money attached. It's a blank check that says, You've done your job. That's how I, that's how I felt about it, and that's why I do it. Um, how will people find out more about that? Well, uh, I don't have any website. They can okay. just uh, link it, uh, send me a LinkedIn uh, request. I'll help any veteran anytime. I usually up at 6 a.m. I go to sleep at 2 a.m., seven days a week. Uh, my passion is my kids and my business. And helping veterans is the only other thing that I do. And again, there is no money involved, no endorsement, no sponsorship, no products that I'm selling. I just want to help people just the way you are doing. Yeah, I see you have the six phases of transition process. Um, you have different tracks, employment, entrepreneurship, education, international, yep. retirement, and wounded with. Hoorah. Yeah, see, I'm not, as, I'm not as, a la, as effective at you. I mean, you've written three books. You're working on two more. You got all these videos. All I've done, and I'm a Marine. I just put the camera on and say, hey, listen, here's some stuff. Right, no, no, and, no, and, and I done the seminars hoping to help, but I I'm not as organized like you to do a website and stuff. So if people want to get to me, either they can reach you, and maybe together we can yeah. help them, okay. or they can go on LinkedIn or on the YouTube uh, a channel that I have. But it's really kind of like first come first serve. I hope no, anybody I think, I, I, again, Caesar. I think uh, you've done a lot of things that I uh, originally wanted to do, which was speak at seminars and things like that. But I didn't have. Uh, you know, no one offered, invited me to speak. So I just made my own videos and my own content because <laughs> they didn't invite, I didn't listen. I wasn't invited to speak. So I made my own platform. <laughs> you know, they say that, uh, they say that uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And I got to tell you, I don't compare myself to you, but I am so impressed and so excited about what you've done because you and I have done the two different paths that the other one wanted to do. Right. And together, I think, and this is not a love fest here, but it's a compliment to the, the love that we have for service to others, right? right? And our backgrounds are different, uh, yeah. and, and yet we still want to serve and do more. And right. you've done everything I wanted to do, and I've done stuff that, I, that you wanted to do. Right. So at some point, we're going to have to work together one way or another. You know, right. we just got to get the audience to vote on 
you know, our combined efforts to say, let's say, we'll see you guys together. Right, let, if the audience three choice, how do you guys want to see us working together? Here's five choices, right? And then you guys exactly. cycle the one that you want to see us working together. Vote for the next seminar of uh, Eric and Caesar. Well, I Eric and Caesar you, in the morning. I can tell you, I've heard three different things already. Uh, this program is a great one. Uh, the new, the new facility that you just built is an excellent one um, with the nonprofit. We definitely. Uh, there's a lot of resources we could throw at that. Um, uh, I've got several podcast guests um, that could help you with that facility as well that are in your area. Uh, so right. I mean, there's just so much overlap that we could we can add even more value to the GovCon space and the GovCon community um, that I can see. Just just come in about. any way I can help, man. I'm in. I mean, I'm in not just because I love serving others. I I think that. When two people have chemistry uh, and it's natural, like, you know, sometimes interviews can be very just uh, rough yeah. and hard to do. You know this because you do this a lot. I know. I just feel there's such a natural flow between us. It's just chemistry that, that because we're focused on who we're serving versus right. our own success. And that to me is priceless. So I'll do anything uh, that you need me to do and work with you in any way I can. Count no, me I in. Think, and I think, I think you've done it by first coming on to the show. So that's the first step is by coming on and sharing your experiences and stories with others um, and continuing along that path. Let yeah. me ask you something. I'm going to ask you something. Do you shop on Amazon online? Oh, yeah. I mean, I love it. Okay, Amazon. what's your most recent purchase that has brought you great joy from Amazon? Excellent. You know what? That was an easy one. Uh, on Sunday, I bought my sister a set of candles um, that are themed. It's a Mediterranean theme. Um, and again, I don't make a, an issue of pity stories about my sister got diagnosed with uh, colon cancer stage four in October last year. And she goes to chemotherapy every other Wednesday. And so I like to get her a gift that she can receive by that Wednesday. So it takes her mind off of, you know, she takes three days to recover. And so that was the latest, uh, the latest purchase I made and I sent it to her. She got it early, so she got it today. And I was excited because she sent me a video telling me like, I love, I love the, uh, the candles. Well, you answer this, I'll show you the video so you know I'm not, you know, you and I live on, uh, on making sure that we can uh, prove Back. what we said. That's right, that's and, uh, right. This was her video, opening the package uh, that I sent to her. Oh, yeah, and, gift for you. I see it. And there's, there's the candles. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, well, oh, she's opening up the package now. Yeah, she's opening yeah, it. And, uh, oh, oh, beautiful. Wow. So, hey, no lies, all proof right there in the pudding. No, no, that's great. That's 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 amazing. Uh, I like it. I like it. No, and and I think that 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 question uh, opens up so much more because, like you said, we've gone probably an hour and change, and we not we haven't spoken about your sister and and that story. So, I think that's important because one of the things, Caesar, I think, um, and you said this earlier. You know, you love your family, uh, and then your business. I think again, we all have friends, family. We have situations going on, right? Uh, we have the real, the regular world that's happening in and around us. Um, and I think that's really important to know that, again, you are a regular person. You know, Caesar's not immune to uh, having a family member or trauma or someone having a terminal illness. You're not immune to that stuff happening. No, and I'll tell you, uh, in, in what I think people don't know about you and I is that we, while we're doing what we're doing, we still have to take care of our family. And Jenny, my sister, is a strong woman very strong. One of the things I love about Jenny is that she's a fighter and she, she has found God through this. When you talk about, you know, does God answer prayers? And, and again, I'm a very faithful man and, and I make no excuses about that. And everything I do is guided by Providence. She has found God in this, which would never have happened. But in this process of doing business with others, you realize that doing business with a purpose has to be guided by the principles that you live your life by, by the idea that Everything you do has to bring value and purpose to others. And Jenny's a great example of that. She reminds me of that all the time. She thinks, you know, she says, I admire you. I'm like, no, listen, you know, God didn't give me cancer because I wasn't strong enough. He gave it to you because he knew that you would be able to teach us all, the other four siblings, how to fight it. And I have discovered her strength, which ties into what we're doing because a lot of times people as small businesses, they want to give up. They want to, no, they, let me say this. They don't want to, they, they, they are, they are sometimes forced to give up because they want to use 
what's happening in their lives as a reason to say, well, I'm not meant to do this anymore. And all we tell them is, listen, fight 24 more hours, just one more day, one more step, one more RFI, one more video, just click it and listen to it. And maybe it'll happen, but don't give up. Giving up is, is just always one step away from success in every situation. You could, in this you know from almost every success story that they could have gone wrong, but they stuck with it. And where you are today, which uh, I, I would hope you would share with us some of it, when did you feel like you could have just said, that's it, I'm done. And you chose to say, I can't because of somebody or something. Is there a time when you had that happen? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and my audience knows the story, but I'll share it really briefly. Uh, yeah, we, um, there was a time where I was doing really well and I was winning all the accolades and my company's on the rise and we were bringing on other people. And um, I decided, Caesar, I want to expand into the private sector. And, and you know, mm-hmm. I was doing government contracts, but again, those long cycles, right? You're building for pipeline of work. And so in growing out my small business, I said, well, uh, you know, I could double my sales if I went over to the private sector and right. So I've got a diversification. Couple million here. Huh? Diversification, diversification, right? And I said, well, but but that happened, um, and we were still coming out of that that really rough spot of the 08 market took place, and so some of those contracts that I that I was awarded in the private sector, uh, because in construction. There is the design, the concept phase. There's the drawing, right. the plan. I learned that with this building, yeah. So by the That's time that you actually get to construction, that those things took were a year ago or two years yeah. ago. Site plan and building plan are critical. I didn't know that. Yeah. I spent a million dollars on site plan and building plan before you put one iola of equipment on the ground. I hear you. And 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 and, and imagine right, and you add that to the fact that you're doing uh, working with a, a large organization. And uh, they're going to get funding. And so it had been, some of these projects were approved uh, like post the real estate recession, 2009, 10. So there was no funding. And, and, and so the companies, there was no other work. So companies took them at, you know, 1%, 2% margins. And they were hoping to make their backs off the little guys like me. So I did that, took on two of those projects. And... Um, Basically, I got terminated from them, um, and then they turned around and sued me, right, at the mm-hmm. same time to avoid paying me what I was owed from them terminating me early. Uh, oh, yeah. And let me tell you, I, I remember, Caesar. Um, oh, it was interesting because uh, one of the companies, the, the vice, I mean, and again, this is, these are big companies, right? So I'm, I'm doing, I think I was doing about $2.5 million at this point in, in sales. Mm-hmm. And this company's doing 150 million or 200 million, right? So they got an army of lawyers and everything. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. VP, he was a, I don't think it was that mean. I think he was a fairly straight up guy, kind of guy. And he said, hey, listen, son, you're a young guy. And he said, uh, why don't you call your insurance company and see if they'll cover like the lawsuit, right? We hadn't been sued. And um, I didn't know any better. So I said, let me call my insurance company, Caesar, right? And, and I asked my insurance company, I said, hey, look, um, this company's threatening to sue me. Would you guys pay the cost of the lawsuit? I've always carried liability. You know, I've got I've got all these policies of insurance, right? Especially in construction. Here it comes. Here it comes. Right. And so uh, the insurance company goes, well, we can't cover the the um, if mm. you're sued, we can't cover the suit. He goes, but we will cover the cost for all the attorney's fees to fight and defend the lawsuit for the duration of the time. And that's mm. actually was better than a lawsuit, Caesar, because I was not in the wrong. What a blessing. So, big, so Caesar, I was never, I didn't do anything wrong. Um, these people were trying to find ways to get money out of small companies. And that's part of their business models on, on the private sector, which is another reason why I tell you about the whole, I, I, I'm so passionate about the government because I've seen this type of, uh, uh, of uh, predatory behavior from large organizations where there's no controlled environment. Okay, especially in construction, and mm-hmm. uh, so they covered the law. I was sued for my contract was four hundred thousand. They sued me for seven hundred, which is almost double my contract. Uh, they <laughs> owed me a hundred and eighty. Um, and so so the insurance company picks up the attorney's cost. One of my suppliers, I owed him like twenty or thirty thousand, but at that point I had I didn't have any money to pay, 
And he said to me, he said, let me ask you something. He goes, you know, uh, I explained the situation. Hey, these guys didn't pay me. He was in construction. He knew the story. He had the same experience. He goes, you know what? I was there. I had a $10 million business. I didn't get paid. And um, so that's why I'm a ma- I work for this company now. He's, he became an employee. He lost his business behind it. So he understood my pain. He, he like this guy, the collection guy, he said, he says, let me ask you something. And again, I don't even know this guy's name today. I wish I knew his name, Caesar. I would, I would give the guy probably like 20 grand if I knew, if I could find this guy. He said to me, he said, mm-hmm. what did you do, right? When you first got in construction where you liked what you did? And I said, you know, I never had a problem with government contracts. I said, I just made money. I did my job. No one was trying to sue me. You know, you, you go to work, you get paid. And I, I don't know. I don't understand this private sector market business where they're trying to, to trying to like gain off of my, off of my, you know, bankruptcy or my misfortune. They're trying to financially gain and profit. And he says, well, I got some advice for you. Go back to that. That and was the did. message. And you did. And so eventually I did. Yeah. But going, mm. speaking of that lawsuit, Caesar, uh, I had some people that, again, uh, people that my peers that were much further along where I was at, I was part of an organization called EO. And they said to me, well, Eric, you know, aren't you planning on being a success? Aren't you planning on being a millionaire? So what is a couple hundred thousand dollar lawsuit? Right. And they, so that's what's the way that they successful people looked at. They said, you haven't even been sued yet. Why would you throw in a towel? What is there that, what is there that you have, you're quitting, but they haven't even done anything. You haven't even allowed the outcome to take place and you're going to quit. Because my yeah. attorney told me to file bankruptcy. Because that's an Ooh. attorney's advice. He's not an entrepreneur. He's an attorney. But my yeah. at- entrepreneur friend says, I've been sued dozens of times. Nothing came out of it. You know, so long story short, we'll wrap it up. Um, they sued me, the insurance company paid for the lawyer, the attorney, um, we said, I said all the facts, all the evidence, all the information, this is what happened, blah, 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 blah. The Caesar, they started the job late, mm. the company, and then, fi- and then charged me for not being there when they started it, after they started it late. And it was like a whole bunch of, at the end of the day, the 700,000 lawsuit, we ended up settling with them. They, uh, ended up. Sell, accepting a five thousand dollar settlement on seven hundred thousand. Wow! wow. Five. I mean, a lot of that money. That that's that's. Think about that's, if I had given them. What if I had the seven hundred thousand to give to them? But, but wait, wait a minute, because you see, see your personality and your spirit comes through in the positive side of the story. And I was asking you about a challenge, and you see, this is how you are successful. You don't look at yourself and say, because you didn't tell us, how, was, how hard was it in the times when you thought that you may not have won? See, right. you focus, see, you, you're, you're so built for that positive thinking that right. you don't even yes. think, right. you don't even think those were days of struggle. You oh. probably didn't sleep, no. you didn't eat, no. you weren't smiling, and you were thinking, everything I work for is going to go to hell in the handbasket. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I only say that because it is a testament to how you see success. Right. You, you saw this and you saw the blessing in the skies, the silver lining, and you came out of it. And, and again, you didn't sit there in the valley of the shadows, no. but you certainly felt it. I felt you it. felt it. I felt and it. you kept fighting the good fight and didn't give up. Right. So my thought in this process, like a lot of people out there don't realize that to get to where you have been, Right. You have struggled, oh, yeah. you have pained, and you right. have doubted. Right. And if you don't wake up in the morning telling yourself, it's okay, whatever happens, I'm good with who I am, right? I am good with myself. You have that built in. And I hope that the people listening can, can capture that in a bottle and say, that's it. I got to drink that Kool-Aid. Because what you said is critical. When they told you, what's $200,000? Successful people take risks that make them successful because they don't, they don't take, you know, unnecessary risks. They take calculated right. and educated risks, right. but they take risks. And yeah. In order to be successful, you have to be willing to look at the big picture, not right. the little $5, but the big picture. Right. In the end, 
five thousand dollars. You could have gone the other way and said that said no. What if I had filed bankruptcy? What if I filed bankruptcy? Oh. But now, Caesar, check this out. That company actually filed bankruptcy and became dissolvent. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. What they happened? Did. To that now let me tell you what. I, so what think about what that. They filed bankruptcy, which is why they settled for five k. Because even their lawyers were going to not get paid in the bankruptcy. <laughs> Now, let me tell you, let me tell you what I think, right? This is a funny part. Had you filed bankruptcy, I guarantee you'd be doing webinars on how to recover from bankruptcy because that's who you are. Yeah, that's you know, true. you would have made it a success story somehow. And I say that as a testament to you, brother, because I'm telling you, it's not flattery. It's what I get as a vibe from you. You're really the real deal trying to help small businesses yeah. realize that no matter what happens to you, you know, you got to look at success. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things if they just put their mind to it. Yeah, no, it's true. And I, and I tell people that. I go, look, I've, I've started this thing twice. The first time I started, I had $5,000. The second time, I was actually mm -hmm. negative, and I started, and I still won, picked up contracts. And two years later, uh, I had won my biggest contract ever, Caesar. Two years from that day, I won the biggest contract I ever won in my life. I was a single contract. It was almost close to $5 million bucks. And that's what gave me the fuel to say, okay, this is a two-year contract. I'm going to be receiving X amount of dollars per month for the next two years. Uh, and, and I decided to, that's when I decided to launch the YouTube channel. I, I got, I got one, one question for you, if I may, that, that's important for me to understand and hopefully for the viewers. Who was the most influential person in your life? And, and besides God and your faith, who was maybe the most inspiring or the one that tipped you because maybe at some point you were on a path and then something happened with you or somebody inspired you or you and sometimes we don't know that but maybe you can think back at the one thing that changed your life the inspiration of person in your life that among all the other mentors and people who have been influential in your life was the one that you can credit the most for what you become today so i can say that um during those times where it was dark, uh, I know the person that gave me that advice, they were the most inspiring person at that time. Mm. Okay, so it was one of my EO mentors, uh, Eloise, and she's the one that um, had been successful. And I mean, this lady was making a lot of money and she was a lot like how I am today. Very a giver, um, you know, people were in this organization for entrepreneurs, Caesar. And the membership was, you know, two, three thousand a year, sometimes five, ten thousand a year. She was sponsoring people, and we didn't even know this. So she was so you're taking these small entrepreneurs and they qualify on paper to be in these programs, but they didn't have the, the, the finances. I never knew. I found this out years later. She was actually paying their dues so they can be a part because she believed in the power of that community and the organization. So I mean Where's she now? Huh? Where is she now? She's still around. No, she's she's still here. She's around. I mean, um, she's still no, doing the same thing. A salute to her for what she did for yeah. so many people. In the, she, you guys she, is, she has been the best blessing to so many small business entrepreneurs of all walks of life and of all backgrounds. And I can tell you, I did not realize, Caesar, how much knowledge I knew about government contracting. And she said to me, she says, are you kidding me? She goes, you... No, she, she says, Eric, I know entrepreneurs because she's been part of the EO. And if you've never heard of EO, look it up. It's on, on EO's an, an international network of entrepreneurs around the world. I think it's like the second largest network of entrepreneurs around the globe. And you have to be a founder. You can't have inherited the business. You got to be a majority owner or founder because they want people who actually do yeah. business, not people who are just daddy's business. Right? No, no, no. They want doers. They want you to have done, have felt the pain, the struggle, right? The HR, the, you know, sure. two employees are uh, sleeping together or whatever yeah. the case may be. Yeah. Or, you know, they yeah. want you to be in the trenches. So it's so, and I love that about the organization because that's what we need. And it's not a, a, a where we go in and we network type thing. It's where we, we call experience share. So we yeah. share experiences. Uh, we speak in gestalt. We don't give advice. We tell you, this is the situation that happened to me, and this is how I dealt with it. You can take from it what you like, you can, however you perceive it, but we don't go in saying, this is the advice I think you should do. 
I That's say right. to people, and I and if you hear me talk, I tell us everyone, this is what I did and this is what happened. So when people mm-hmm. ask me, I go, you know, I'm not going to give you advice, but I can tell you what I did and what, what, what was the results and the outcome. And yeah. that's, I talk like that. that uh, that's, that's a lot of times what, uh, what uh, um, CEOs need, self-made, what we call safe-made CEOs versus career CEOs, because that's what we are, right? We're self-made. We didn't go, we didn't get groomed to this. We just said, hey, you know, I think I need, I want a standard of living for me and my family, and this is what we're going to do. But we, we were sometimes afraid to ask, uh, or people start comparing. And then you never get that vulnerable environment to be open and honest and share without any expectation or any intent to, to inspire or, or, or uh, not inspire. It's just, here's what happened. Here's how I dealt with it. Do with it what you think. Right. And somebody says, you know what? I've been dealing with this. And they identify with you. We need something like that. I think that uh, I'm, I, I envision that what you're doing here with God Come Giants is the same environment. Right. where small businesses can ask the questions that they're afraid to ask. Because in a conference, the challenge that I have is that people want to ask questions. I always tell people, don't let me go. Don't let me leave here without asking you a question. But you only have so much time, yeah. like in any situation. So I give everybody, everybody my cards. Sadly, out of 50, 100 people, you know how many people actually contact me? You got it. You got it. And that one person, I try very hard to focus on because they follow through on it. Somebody who follows through is going to be successful. They already made the first step. Like you said, just, you know, reach out and let me help you. And then it goes from there. Cesar, look, we've got to run. Uh, I've got a six o'clock. Do me a favor. Give, uh, mm-hmm. Tell everyone how the best way to reach you and then some parting words. Roger that. Um, so you can reach me through Eric because <laughs> this is definitely where I want to live from now on. Uh, right. uh but you can look on LinkedIn and send me a LinkedIn uh, message, or you can email me at Caesar at xcorpsolutions.com. That's Caesar, like the dog food, not like the salad, C-E-S-A-R at xcorpsolutions.com. Give the people some parting words so we can close out officially. I would say that in the big scheme of things, when you're looking at trying to succeed, don't try to focus on the steps that you're taking along the way to measure your success, but the final destination and the people that you meet along the way. Because at the end of your journey, you're not gonna be counting dollars, but the relationships you have. So the success that you build is based on what you just saw here, a chemistry shared by a passion to help others. So try to do the same, and if you are successful, remember one thing, and that is to help someone else, reach down, grab a hold, and pick them up, and get them going. Caesar, thank you so much, I appreciate Simplify, it. Simplify, man, hoorah. <laughs>